I'm Bob, and I've uh, been at Sigma Moose 14 years. Um, moved there fall, not quite 14 years, fall 2008. And uh, started the church there with uh, Mel Reimer, and, and uh, he was the lead pastor back then of SCC, we call it. Mel's a good friend. He's down in Sparwood now. And Pastor Ben, who was the associate pastor, is now the lead pastor of SCC. And I, uh, I always pray for you guys and uh, the, the churches um, in uh, Chase and Sorrento and Salmon Arm. This thing's touching my face. Is it okay? <laughs> Just kidding. <laughs> Just kidding. It's not that bad. Yeah, okay. And... Um, and I, I also pray for Armstrong and Vernon. It's, see, when you, when you know people and you have an actual relationship with them, it makes you pray for those people. And so even if you can only have a cup of coffee with somebody once a year, and it's a good cup of coffee and it's a good conversation, you get to know that person, then they're in your heart, and then the Lord brings them to mind when he wants you to pray for them. And uh, it's really good to be with you. I just thought it'd be fun to get together with the people of God here. And I got an idea. We have a mandolin player in Sigamus today. I want to do a mandolin accordion exchange. <laughs> and I'm serious. That was awesome. I just wanted to keep singing. It brings such joy to your heart. The accordion is a joy-giving instrument. And it's like a revelation to my mind today. I've got to find an accordion player. Um, so when, when I drove here, I thought we had a lot of snow. And uh, I came into town, and I was like, man, the snow removal budget of this place must be something. <laughs> man, oh, man. But it's okay you don't have toboggan hills because you can just make them in your front yard, right? Just climb up that 500 meters and then just... But the pussy willows are poking their head out. That's, that's great. Um, I've got four daughters. They're growing up. They're now 28, 26, 24, and 21. And uh, beautiful wife, Sandra, is the reason that those girls turned out okay. And she's been married to me for 32 years. And uh, we've had this, tomorrow's our 34th Valentine's Day together. And um, I, uh, I, I think about my girls, and it brings me joy. I, uh, I text my wife to tell her I miss her when she's at work. And uh, she says, yeah, yeah. And, and uh, but... There's, there's some things in life that really make me smile. One of them, obviously, today I learned of the accordion makes me joyful. And the sunshine, because the Sigma we don't get much of that this time of year. So today, is a, I'm thankful for that. But this is the time of year when you need to find those things that bring you joy, right? This time of year is brutal. I mean, we got January in the rearview mirror. For me, January is that feeling they, C.S. Lewis talked about, always winter and never Christmas, Right? But I'm trying to uh, get me and my church to look forward. To actually, Easter is something to really look forward to. And to have something to um, look forward to at Easter, okay, plan a big family meal. And maybe this year, get a gift exchange in your family. One person gets one gift from your family. And make it something like a book to encourage their faith or um, a journal or something to inspire their faith and have a gift exchange at Easter dinner. I want to do that with my family this year because Easter should be as big a deal as Christmas and the gifts should really focus us on Jesus. And uh, this time of year, um, for me, without the sun, I try and get as much as of the sun, S-O-N, as I can and focus on Jesus um, so that I can... I can Get better myself, because all of us have a post-Christmas slump. All of us do. And that's why I don't start anything at our church until around January 15th, because it's like everybody's like, yeah, yeah. It's like getting them to church after Christmas is like, wow, it's hard. And, but, you know, when I was um, a youth pastor in Hope back in 1992, I read a book called The Youth Pastor Survival Guide. And it said you can never quit between October 1st and May 1st. You can never quit between those two months. You can wait till the grass is green and the weather's beautiful and it's after May 1st and then you can consider a different career or a different job. But you can't quit between October 1st and May 1st. Well, if you're a Narnia fan like me, the deal is, is that um, Aslan is on the move. 
Jesus is on the move, and he is changing the world, and he's got a plan. I know right now when you look at the news and everything, it doesn't feel like Jesus has got a plan. He's got a plan. But the thing about the advance of Aslan in the books of Narnia is that winter began to melt when Aslan was on the move. And so what you have to keep in mind is this side of Jesus' return, it is always going to be some form of winter. But Jesus is on the move, and things are slowly thawing. And he's thawing out my cold heart the more I think about him, the more I get to know him. And one thing that this pandemic has done to Bob Evans is it's made me need Jesus even more, and it's made me closer to Jesus than I've ever been before. And it's given me the zip to get through this thing. I popped into somebody's office um, and, uh, in Sigamoose to, to say hi, and uh, they said, what's the energy you have about you? And I said, it's Jesus. And they, of course, wanted to think the universe had given me some form of energy. And I said, the one that gave, me the universe, gave us the universe is giving me that form of energy. It's this Holy Spirit. It's the Spirit of Jesus. Enthusiasm is enthused, spirit in. So today we're going to be talking about how we get the Spirit of God in us. And this sermon's called The Spirit to Come Back to Life. And right now we all need that in a big way, right? Um, I would track my, uh, my youth attendance or my church attendance every year, and this is how it would go. Be a strong surge in September. By the end of September, we go up. October, winter hits, evens out a little bit. December, oh, we're in through the of Christmas, January, boom. And then we go... A little bit more in February, and then March stays out a bit, and then Easter, whoa, yeah, it's good, and the tennis starts to climb again. And then you could track this red line, and it was the same every year. Summer, even out, people away here, people away. It's okay, September climb, boom, January. It's just the way it goes. So you can't live on your feelings, and that's one thing that I have always had to fight because I'm a musician, I'm an artist. And I'm a man of deep feeling. I'm on that ride too. This was a roller coaster for me. Watching my church attendance, it was my roller coaster too. I had to get beyond that. And I've found that in my life right now, I have got to see beyond the pandemic. Right now, I've got to see that Jesus is still changing lives. And I can go six months on a salvation. I can go six months on somebody taking a step closer to Jesus. The 21st century, and I'm, I'm not trying to depress you when I start to talk about this, okay? But you know what they say, the bad news means you have to have the good news, so here we go. 21st century did not start off easily either, okay? You remember the literal panic of Y2K, 2000? If you're old enough, you remember that. I know a guy in Sycamore who still has an attic full of kerosene and bullets, he says, Evans, you wouldn't believe what those bullets are worth now. I've used up all the drinking water, but I got tons of kerosene. You need some? Come on over. And uh, Y2K was panicky, big time. I mean, I watched the New Year kick in in Australia just to see if all the lights in Sydney went out. They didn't go out. That's good news. And look, there's a plane. It's not dropping out of the sky. Oh, yeah. Right? No, it wasn't that bad. But then 2001, my goodness, 9-11. That began to change the whole world. It started the longest war, right? And then the great cultural wars between political ideals, traditional values, liberalism, all this stuff started in, you know, around 2000. It feels like 2008, with the crash and... And all these things that started to happen in the world on a, on a bigger scale. And the moral divide in North America over politics. Before the pandemic, there was a pandemic of division over ideals. And I'd never seen anything like it before in my short 50 years. And then the pandemic. Man, this has not been a great first 25 years of the 21st century. Right? Right? That is, is the time of the century, it's been the hardest so far for me. Hardest on us all. The men and women that went all over the world to fight terrorism and the victims of those terrorists suffered greatly. But now, for us, 
this is the first time in the 21st century that we've all felt a low-lying black cloud over us. And it has sucked the life out of us. It feels like somebody has stuck a big siphon into our heart and just started sucking all the gasoline out of the engine. And uh, one of my favorite writers says, cars are meant to run on gasoline, right? Humans are meant to run on the Spirit of God. What do we do instead? Right now, Coca-Cola is way cheaper than gasoline. But if you put Coca-Cola in your car's gas tank, you're done. What is mankind trying to do right now? Put Coca-Cola in their gas tank. Anything. Multiple affairs of people I know. Self-medicating the stress of the pandemic. Making more money. Binge-watching Netflix like never before. I mean, they did it before the pandemic. My friend Mark says, three hours of Netflix and five minutes of the daily bread make it the daily crumb. It ain't going to do the job. You've got to read more about Jesus because we're putting Coca-Cola into our gas tank. We wonder while we're flagging, while we're just going, put, 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 spitter, sputter. It's like I'm driving my dad's old Hyundai XL. Um, so, you know, the stress I see on people's faces when I walk into the store, I'm a friendly guy, and, and uh, I, you know, I, I mean, I'm triple vaxxed or whatever, and I walk up to this guy, I don't even think about it, and I go, I haven't seen this guy in a long time. I go, hey, how you doing? He goes, oh, 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 oh. And I'm like, oh, right, I forgot, I can't touch you, I'm sorry. And I wasn't mocking him, but the stress, I was like, oh, wow, wow. And I realized this guy doesn't have Jesus, so he doesn't have my optimism. And the way we're all trained to look down now in stores, not even make eye contact and avoid coming close to people, it's been hard. I don't know how people date in the pandemic when everything was stressed out. I don't know. Hey, how do you know if that girl's really good looking? All you see is her eyes. <laughs> right? I mean, it's got to be stressful. I'm glad I was married. Um, but I would say this. For the 21st century, the pandemic is the icing on a very bad cake. Many churches I know and talk to, many pastors I know and talk to, really will tell you that they feel like the life or the soul has been sucked out of them. They say 60, 70% of pastors are going to quit and move to a different church. Think about it. Um, my life is the church. Your life is including the church. But you build something over 14 years and then you see, after 14 years with the pandemic, that the numbers are 30 40% down. If I were to live on those numbers, I would want to quit too. But that's not what it's about. And uh, so how do we come back from this? How do you bounce back? How are we revitalized? How do we get our strength back? How do we get our mission back if we've lost it? One of the reasons I think that the Lord has been gracious to me is that he gave me a more urgent sense of mission than ever before when this pandemic started. So first off, if you feel the, the way that I'm describing, which most of us do, we need to ask God's spirit to work in us because this is all about Jesus, whether we have enough of Jesus. Because he's everything we need. He's a boundless supply of grace and mercy for every day, and uh, he is what we need. Bound supply wisdom. If any of you lacks wisdom, let him ask of God, who gives to all men freely. Will not hold it back. So we need to ask God's spirit to be here. So we're going to go to scripture and talk about God's spirit today and what we do to get more and more of Jesus. So if you go back to Genesis 2, verse 7, in the, um, in the NIV, I'll give you a second to go back. We're only going to turn to two passages or three today, so I won't make you do too much. But uh, as my friend Norm the trucker would say, hang a left in your Bible to Genesis chapter 2, verse 7. Let's stand for the reading of God's word. Then the Lord God formed a man from the dust of the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath 
of life. And the man became a living being, soul. Father God, we pray that your spirit now would be poured through your word into our hearts as a breath of life to make us living beings. In Jesus' name, all God's people said, amen. Please have a seat. So this verse that we read is not long, but it's packed full of meaning. We are formed out of the dust. God handmade man. He just said elephant. There was an elephant. He just said rhino. There was a rhino. He just said dolphin. There was a smiling dolphin. He just said mountain. There was a mountain. He just said light, and there was light. He just said moon. There was moon. He just said sun, and there was the sun. But he took time to craft us and shape us in his image. And then the spirit of God that hovered over those waters breathed the breath of life into our nostrils and we became a living being. The Hebrew word here is nephesh, soul, a living soul. The self that you are, the life that you have, which breathes as an eternal being, the breathing substance of being, your soul, the inner being, your inner woman, your inner man, the seed of your appetites, the seed of your emotions and your passions. So we are souls and bodies that God made. The Bible says, good news, he remembers we're made of dust. But he loves us. He, being the spirit of God, gives life to your soul. Your soul is that person that you would still be if you were a quadriplegic and not much work. You'd still be you. The soul is the source of your appetites and your longings and your passion. God said to Adam and Eve way back in Genesis 1, do not eat the forbidden fruit because when you eat it, you will certainly die. And they ate it and the first thing that died was our soul. It started to shrivel up. Then what happened was that day that souls, the soul of man began to die, the body followed suit. The earth followed suit. We had volcanoes and hurricanes. Stars began to die because we ate the forbidden fruit. But right away, God said, I'm going to come and restore your soul. I'm going to send my son, Genesis 3. Once the soul began to die, it became weak. Our minds followed. And you could tell somebody who's a Romans 1 person because their mind doesn't work properly because they follow every twisted idea out there in the world. And uh, we can see why mankind has ruined themselves. And our lives and bodies became dark like our thinking. And this is where the problems of the world come from, right? The walking dead are humans. That's what humans are. Their bodies work, their minds work, but they're twisted. And the soul, the engine of the human being, is dead. And we need the Spirit of God to come and breathe life back into the human soul. And you can see a human being fully alive. When you meet them, you just know Jesus is in them, that they're alive again. The Spirit of God has regenerated their souls. And so today, I'm going to ask you to just really think about how to breathe in the Spirit of God, the seed of your emotions and passion, and that will give you more new life to be able to go out into the world as a blazing torch because what happens to fire when wind hits it? Right? It gets stronger. And so I'm praying today the Spirit of God will breathe his wind of the spirit upon the fire in your heart and stoke it, stoke those flames. So I was watching um, Star Trek a lot when I was a little kid. So when William Shatner went into space, it, I thought that was cool. Captain Kirk went to space, right? When he came back and talked about his journey into space, you could see he was quite rattled. And uh, he said this, he says, the blackness and the feeling of the void and my fragility as a human being, my limitations, and it was like death. He didn't come back all. He, I mean, I think he had fun, but I think he was overwhelmed about how small and fragile he was. At 90 years old, he's definitely thinking about, about death. So what's the solution? What's the solution for William Shatner and for you and me and for your friends that aren't here yet today? Jesus has somebody in Revelstoke for every chair that's empty today. And if they would just hear the gospel, 
He's got them ready for the gospel. The workers like you are, I want to, blip, I want to see your torches boosted today so you can go out and get those people and fill these chairs. So how do we do that? Well, it's Jesus and much of Jesus, much of his spirit delivered to our souls. That's the solution. The scriptures tell us in Romans that the spirit of God who raised Jesus from the dead lives in you and you and you and you and you and me. The spirit of God that gave life to Jesus Christ while he was in the tomb lives in you and me and he will give life to your mortal bodies and this by the same spirit who lives in you, Paul says, Romans 6, 10 and 11. Turn to Ezekiel 37, if you will. Ezekiel chapter 37, verse 1. Pastor Jordan said it was okay if I read the NIV today, so that's what I'm reading from. Okay. Ephesians 37, 1. The hand of the Lord was on me, and he brought me out by the Spirit of the Lord and set me in the middle of a valley. It was full of bones. He led me back and forth among them, and I saw a great many bones on the floor of the valley, bones that were very dry. He asked me, Son of man, can these bones live? I said, Sovereign Lord, you alone know. Then he said to me, Prophesy to these bones and say to them, Dry bones, hear the word of the Lord. This is what the sovereign Lord says to these bones. I will make breath enter you and you will come to life. I will attach tendons to you and make flesh come upon you and cover you with skin. I will put breath in you and you will come to life. Then you will know that I am the Lord. So I prophesied as I was commanded. And as I was prophesying, there was a noise a rattling sound, and the bones came together bone to bone. I looked, and tendons and flesh appeared on them, and skin covered them, but there was no breath in them. Then he said to me, prophesy to the breath, prophesy, son of man, and say to it, this is what the sovereign Lord says, come breath from the four winds and breathe into these slain that they may live. So I prophesied as he commanded me, and breath entered them. They came to life and stood on their feet, a vast army. Then he said to me, Son of man, these bones are the people of Israel. They say, Our bones are dried up, and our hope is gone. We are cut off. Therefore prophesy and say to them, This is what the Sovereign Lord says. My people, I am going to open your graves and bring you up from them. I will bring you back to the land of Israel. Then you, my people, will know that I am the Lord when I open up your graves and bring you from them. And I will put my spirit in you and you will live and I will settle you in your own land. Then you will know that I, the Lord, have spoken and I have done it, declares the Lord. I look out and I see the dry bones. It says here that I looked and there was a valley of dry bones bleached by the sun, just dead. Just imagine this vision of a valley full of white bones doesn't look like there's any hope. It's just devastating. And if you watch the news every day, that's what's going to happen to your soul. I did a 28-day challenge with my church, and some of the action steps for the days are skip the news today. Just do nothing but the good news. Don't just listen to the radio station. Get worship music on. The first thing you do when you wake up, I got one of those smart speakers. It's pretty cool. I go, hey, Google, play worship music. So I wake up, the atmosphere in my home changes. It's a valley of dry bones. I see it. I see it on people's faces. One guy in my church, I was talking to him, and he was really down. And I said, you know, God's doing some good things through this pandemic. And he looked at me with a blank stare. Because all he's thinking of is the news and politics. I said, God's doing some great things. And I told him about somebody that got saved. I told him about a lady that walked up to me in the store and said, hey, I feel really drawn to Jesus Christ. I can't explain it. Could you get me a Bible? Yeah, I can do that. (laughs) Can you wait here? I'll run to the hub and get it. 
Maybe God is asking you this morning this question. Do you want to be restored? Do you want to put some meat on those bones? I have two dogs. Max is 14. Tia is four. Tia is young and healthy and spry. Max, I don't know, his breed of dog, you could give that guy peanut butter every meal and he wouldn't put an ounce on his flesh. And you pet him and it's just like bone and fur. It's like, oh man, could you just eat some more yolk or peanut butter or something? Like, he'd give that dog some chicken, Sandra. He just doesn't have any meat on his bones. Tia, she's full of life and vigor. And Max walks around like this. He needs some meat on his bones. And I want to ask you this morning to remember what Jesus said to the church at Laodicea that was feeling dead inside because they'd gone to the Coca-Cola of the world, the riches, the prestige, the reputation. And Jesus said, I stand at the door this morning and I knock. And if you will hear me knocking and open the door, I will come in. And what brings you more life than anything is supper with Jesus. He says, I wait to be wanted. The la- that famous painting of Jesus knocking on the door of Laodicea is a door with the Lord knocking and there's no doorknob on the outside. It's only on the inside. So you have to open the door. Jesus is knocking at the door. He waits to be wanted. Do you want to live? Do you want your breath back? Do you want your enthusiasm back? Son or daughter, do you ache for the power of God in your life? So God said to Ezekiel, prophesy to the bones and say to them, dry bones, hear the word of the Lord. And I'm asking you, do you hear the knocking? Dry bones, do you want to hear the word of the Lord? Hear him say this morning, I am. I am enough. I am Jesus. I am the true vine. Remain in me. Branches get their life from the vine. I am the bread of life. I have all the filling power you need to feel full and satisfied so you can go out into the world. I am the light of the world in the darkness. I am the light of the world. John 8. I'm the bread of life. John 6. I am the true vine. Stay tapped into me. Remain in me and I will remain in you and you will bear much fruit. John 15. I am the way when you don't know the way. I am the truth when there's nothing but questions. And I am the life when there's nothing but death. John 14, 6. I am the resurrection and the life. Jesus says, John eleven twenty five. I am the good shepherd. When you're feeling lost, come to me. I'll put you in the pen. Wrap my arms around you. Those of you that are watching online, come back to the pen. Be shepherded. Be loved by the people here. I am the gate. Enter through me. Jesus is the only way into the kingdom of life. So hear Christ the Lord say that he is the source. He is everything. So listen to him. Read him every day. Talk about him. Do you talk about Jesus when you're with a Christian friend? Or do you just talk about the pandemic or the news? Or your problems? Talk about Jesus. What has Jesus shown you about himself this week? What did you read in your Bible today? Well, I haven't read my Bible. Okay, let's together get a reading plan. Not just the daily bread, but let's read through the scripture. What did Jesus teach you this week? One thing about himself. You gotta make Jesus your magnificent obsession because, folks, we've been obsessed with everything but Jesus. Make him your magnificent obsession. One preacher said he's the perpetual novelty. He never wears out. So hear the word of the Lord today. And then verse 5 of Isaiah 37, Ezekiel 37. This is what the Lord says to these dry bones. I will make breath enter into you and you will come to life. But you got to stop and breathe. I got this smartwatch thing I didn't wear today because it's really annoying sometimes. Because it tells me to stop and breathe. I'm like in a conversation with someone or I'm on the phone and I'm maybe the, the watch knows my heart rate's going up because I'm stressed out because this person is in such dire need like it was last night when I got a text at 10.30 at night about someone in my church been in an accident and I was, my heart rate went up. And it says, breathe. Boy, that's a good idea actually. And I stop and it says, okay, start now. And it's got this little flower that goes, 
And then it shrinks, let it out. And I'm like, this is so weird. But you know what? It works. But I have to stop what I'm doing and breathe. And Jesus is asking you this morning to stop what you're doing and realize he will give you the holy oxygen of the Holy Spirit. What do they do with hockey players that are damaged? They put them in a hyperbaric chamber and they get more oxygen flooding their body. Jesus says, I will turn Simon's into Peter's. I will turn crazy, frantic fishermen into rocks. Pillars of the faith. I'll take Timothy, a young man that's got no courage. You know we get the word timorous from the name Timothy? That's how powerful the Bible is in culture. Because Timothy was such a nervous fellow. And he, God took Timothy and he made him the pastor of a church mentored by Paul. And unlikely, he turns timid people into triumphant people. Men and women so where do you get your energy, folks? It's Jesus. I will make breath enter into you, but you got to want to come back to life too. Maybe you've become numb and you're just satisfied just putting along here. I have to make myself go to Scripture every day. Because I wake up, and like John Piper says, every day got to get saved for myself. And look what it says in verse 6. I'll attach tendons to you and make flesh come upon you and cover you with skin. I, I always wish that I was one of those guys at Industrial Light and Magic that I could do visual effects because, man, this would be a great visual, right? Dry bones, and it's like they come together and then skin appears on them, muscles, and then you see the breath of God come from the sky. I've got a big imagination. I can see this in my head. God wants to bring your dry bones to life, put skin on you, put meat on your bones, flesh out your faith in a new way. God wants to put some muscle on scrawny Christians. I've got a friend, 38 years old, got COVID, um, had to be intubated. He was down for four weeks, big, strong guy. And he came out of there, praise the Lord, he lived and he's back on his feet. But at first, he lost so much muscle mass from just laying there. It's amazing when you don't, do anything, you lose your muscle mass. And he, at first, could walk the length of the arena in Sycamus and back to his car, and he have to get back home and go home and have a sleep. But now he can use the snowblower on the driveway because he had to build back that muscle. God wants to put muscle on scrawny Christians. He wants to give you the breath of life fueled by oxygenated blood from the Holy Spirit, and you'll get stronger over time. Um, A.W. A. Tozer, I read a book of his on the Spirit of God, and he says, like, Christians are like a barrel, wooden barrel, that gets filled with water, but we're full of holes. And so you fill up, but your life's full of holes because you're human, and then you fill up in the morning with Jesus, or, and then by noon you're like half a tank, and by supper you're like sucking fumes. There's nothing left. You've leaked out the Holy Spirit. And what happens over time is the more that you fill up with God's spirit and the truth of Jesus and you do what he says, Jesus starts to plug the holes in your life and you'll leak less. <laughs> he starts to fill you up and you'll retain it more and he starts to plug the holes with your obedience to scripture and your, your time with him and then you start to remain full. And then what happens to a person that's full of the Holy Spirit is it gets to the top and then it spills all of the lives of other people and refreshes them. And so that's what's got to happen to us. And so um, I know I'm mixing metaphors. That the air we breathe is the spirit of God. The water of life, Jesus fills our, our barrels up. He's the gas in the tank that makes the human work properly. So I'm going to ask you today to start working out, putting on some muscle. As Jesus breathes his life into you, don't fall for the lie that you've got muscle because you've got human muscle, okay? There's spiritual muscle, there's human muscle. Some of you have a lot of human muscle and you look like a successful person because you're good looking or you're, you're athletic or you've got money or you've got a good reputation, you've got a good job and you think that you've got muscle but really your, your spiritual muscle is, is, is weak, don't fall for the lie because you have human might, money, prestige, reputation, good looks, talent. A lot of us think that if you have talent, you're good. 
you're fine, but you're, you're not without Christ's spirit living in you and you're lost without him. So I say to you, come to Christ for life to get his muscle. And you're human, but you're no longer merely human. That's the difference between a Christian and a non-Christian is we are not merely human. We got the spirit of God in us. And then verse nine, it says, prophesy to the breath, prophesy son of man. This is what the Lord says. Come breath from the four winds and breathe into these slain. I'm not a guy that waits for a sign. When I pray, I know I got to pray and just go do what I'm supposed to do. But I love it when I'm sitting on the deck and I'm praying. And then a breeze comes. And I don't think that's necessarily the Spirit of God. But when that happens, it cues me into seeing that Jesus wants to hear my prayer and give me his breath to go out into the day. Um, I'll have a, a, an appointment where um, I'm, I'm at a joyful appointment with somebody that's growing in Christ, and it's a discipleship appointment. And then I remember one day when I had to get back in the car and drive the 13, 15 minutes to Mara to see a young man, a good friend of mine whose dad had committed suicide, and I was going from a high to a low, back to a high, and my emotions do this. And I had 15 minutes, so I put a Billy Graham message on YouTube on my car and listened to it. I didn't watch it because I was driving, but I listened to it. And I tell you, that 12-minute drive, I was a different person when I got to his house because I knew the good news. You got to listen to the good news all the time. And then this is what happened, okay? The breath of life entered the dry bones, and then there was a vast army standing before the Lord. Do you realize you're part of a vast army? The Sikamu Squadron loves the Revelstoke platoon. You guys are amazing. You sent us more money so we could maybe get a building built over the next five years, and God bless you for that. Thank you. We're part of a vast army. Your sergeant, Pastor Jordan, Good guy, loves Jesus, and he loves you. But I'm saying, Lord, come from the four winds and breathe life into Revelstoke Baptist Church, who was slain and knocked down by the boulders of the pandemic. Some, some of these people are shot through with arrows of doubt. Some of you have been shot through with arrows of division. Breathe Jesus into your, your life, and may the fruit of the Spirit of love, joy, peace, faithfulness, gentleness, kindness, self-control, fill your life. And may God raise up this squadron of believers to your feet to be part of the vast army. And guys, get this, of billions, vast army of billions of people today that worshiped. That's why we still have Christmas. Billions worship Jesus. You're part of a vast army. Army, I saw photos of the biggest baptism in history. Happened last March. 1,500 people. All the churches lined up behind their pastor at the beach, lined up to go into the ocean. It was beautiful. There is good news out there. Google good news about Christianity, and it was an article. You message me on Facebook, I'll send you the link. You're part of a vast army, billions strong. There's more Christians in China than anywhere. And they kicked the missionaries out 65 years ago. Nothing can stop the church. My favorite verse in the Bible is this one. After this I looked, and there before me was a great multitude that no one could count from every nation, tribe, people, and language standing before the throne and in front of the Lamb. You were beat down, you're part of Israel. The verse, verses that were read before the sermon couldn't have gone better with it. You are God's chosen people, holy and dearly loved, a holy nation, a kingdom of priests. You go out into the world, and this is what you say to your friends when they tell you their problems. All I could tell you is Jesus loves you, and I love you, and I'm praying for you. And mention his name. There's two twins in Sigamus. They're 20 years old. Dad committed suicide when they were 13. Mom died a year ago, 20. They have nobody. No grandparents, no uncles, no nobody. And I just want to be their dad. The other day I took them to get some groceries, I took them to get some glasses, and we're, we're just doing this work, and um, 
when they got out of the car, I just said, Jesus loves you. And one of them, after a year of trying to help them, said, I love Jesus. And I think she's starting to get it. You were beat down, but you're a kingdom of priests, so go out and proclaim the word. This is what the sovereign Lord says. I'm going to open your graves and bring you up from them. This moment we're stuck in is not something we're stuck in. We're going to rise from the ashes like we sang this morning. Then you, my people, will know that I am the Lord when I open your graves and I bring you up from them. See, past the pandemic, God's got a big plan for the church. I will put my spirit in you and you will live. And you will know that I, the Lord, have spoken and I have done it. You were going to see something happen all over the world that we can only say Jesus did that. This isn't something we made up. This is not the invention of any man. This is the word of the Lord. You will know it is the Lord. And every day, you've got to stop in the morning and breathe him in. You, my people, will know I am the Lord. Jesus every day. Jesus in the morning. Jesus in the evening. He's going to do a new thing. Remember he said that. I'm not going to make things the way they used to be. That's what we want. We want the way things used to be. No, 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 no. He's got a way better plan than that. I'm going to rebuild the world. It's my favorite new commercial is the Lego commercial. It's this kid with his imagination building this bridge for a night to get across to his friend across the river. And the, the tagline at the end of the commercial is rebuild the world. That's what we're going to do. And every time society and empires have fallen, Christians were the one that did that. Christians were the ones who rebuilt the world. If you want proof of his breath, breathe him in in the morning and breathe him in at night. Breathe in the truth and love and then go take it to lost souls. You'll see them resurrected too and you'll know he's real. Don't forget that's why the church is still here. It is our mission to go into the world and breathe his life into someone else. Be settled on your mission. It says, be settled in your identity as a Christian. You will know that I, the Lord, have spoken. I've done it, declares the Lord. God will always prove all of this to be true, guys. So see beyond the pandemic is millions, and I believe it, millions come to Jesus. It will be done. Be there to watch it happen. Your kids might finish the Great Commission. You will know that the Lord has spoken. We can bounce back from this. We are no longer dry bones. We're alive. God will, and remember what Romans 6 said, and I'll finish with it. The spirit of God that raised Jesus from the dead lives in you. And just as God raised Christ Jesus from the dead, he will give life to your mortal bodies by the same spirit living in you. Amen? God bless you.